everyone. I'm Noora Renteria. I'm one of the co-founders of La Nova Link, a collective created to connect and bring visibility to Latinx professionals and creatives doing the work to push La Cultura forward. I am so happy to be here with you all, even if virtually at this year's Futuro Conference, and I'm so thankful for the support from Nylip and from Calixto. When La Nova Link was thinking about what topic to bring to you all, we were also thinking about what we do best. And we were inspired and moved by the conversations around and surrounding representation, as we, a lot of us are here, um, but also wanted to focus it on the folks who we know are doing the work inside, who we believe are and hold the answers to this, to this big problem and to this big question. Um, and so this is where a seat at the table is born. And I'm not solo. I am joined by some pretty fantastic and inspiring mujeres who are impacting and elevating these same kinds of conversations and our community in their respective companies. And we want to make sure to give them their flores. That's also what La Nova Link is all about, is celebrating the folks doing the work and also empowering them to continue. And so I'll start by introducing Jessica Vargas, Director of Multicultural Marketing at HBO, Andrea Gomp brown Editorial Manager at Contodo at Netflix, Claribel Herrera, Marketing Manager at Univision, and Amelia Capaz, Social Media Producer for Defus and Mera on Showtime. Welcome, ladies. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Great. Right. It's Friday. Thank you for having us. It's Zoom, so yeah. it's also hard to get all that feedback at once, so I apologize for even doing that. But uh, I love the range that's here that's represented, and I'm really proud of this lineup, and I think we can dive right in. With a little bit of a warm up question, I'd love to get to know and have the people at home get to know you all. Um, just start off with like, what motivated you to do this specific work? What's your, how did you realize, or when did you realize that this was your mission, your calling? I call it a calling because that's it for me, but how did, how did you realize that? And I'll start with Amelia. Hey, so I feel like specifically for me, because I do work in social media, I think just liking social media and being on it 24 seven in my early twenties, especially was, um, the starting point of that motivation. Um, and I had a lot of very supportive people, especially the people from vice that encouraged me to pursue the career in it. Um, I actually studied fashion merchandising, which has nothing to do with TV yet. Here I am. Um, and I got kind of picked up off Twitter. Um, just stuff tweeting nonsense. And uh, my old boss at, at Vice, Tyler McCauley, he took a chance on me and, and gave me my first opportunity, you know, at a television company or media company. And from there, I connected with Jesus and Mero and I kind of just followed them over to their new channel at Showtime. So for me, I think having the interest, first and foremost, um, is something that can motivate you because if you love what you do it doesn't feel so much like work amen jess do you want to go next uh sure so for me um i've been a time i was a time warner baby for a very long time right so at the age of 17 i had my first job and so i worked in magazines and i never had i okay for, can i say a story my <laughs> dream job dream dream senore was to work at the gap that's all I wanted to do in life, work at The Gap. First of all, The Gap was Fuego when, we, when I was a teenager, right? Um, but I never got called, called back. And I have a, I have a mentor who's, who I've known since the sixth grade. She's like, Jess, why do you want to work at The Gap? Just go buy The Gap with your check. And I was like, you're right, girl. And so um, I applied for an internship uh, at 17 and got it. So ever since then, I've never left the corporate world. So I worked in magazines coming back every year, every summer, every fall break, back to the magazine world, right? So um, that's been all my experience. So I worked at People, Team People, Time, EW. And so for me, magazines weren't that diverse, right? And I, as I was in this corporate world where I was always la única Latina and being super young and like innocent and like, oh my God, I'm so excited just to be here. Um, I kept kind of being like, but we're not in the magazines. Like, why are we in the magazines, right? And so that continued and evolved. And so eventually um, after many years of working in magazines, um, I got my job at HBO, which I've been in at for 11 years now. And um, that just that love of magazine entertainment representation as 
the only like Latina who was in a you know room full of you know gringos, which again are now my my biggest supporters. Um, that was like, I want to do this. I want I want to see my face in that magazine, in a feature, in the cover, right? And so that for me was like, this is what I want to do. And so that that continued into the world of entertainment that I now live in, which is at HBO. From the gap to HBO. We, desperately, guys. I really just want to work at the gap. <laughs> I would love to be I would love to be with you when you're in the gap. I feel like it's like for me it's like Sephora. I'm like Sephora. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No shout out to Brand. Sorry, sorry, delete that. <laughs> um, so I think uh, I'm gonna take it back to like childhood actually, because I uh I recently did a like a career day for a friend who is the principal of a middle school and I got to talk to some middle schoolers and through that process it got me to reflect about how did I feel when I was in middle school and it made me realize actually that there were like little connection points that I never realized since I was little. Um, but I think I always really loved storytelling since I was little. I did a lot of the school plays. I loved to write short stories. Um, when I went to college, I was a literary arts major. Uh, and so I knew that, you know, I was also in a performing arts group called Mezcla, <laughs> our Latino performing arts group. Um, and so I think like across all of those different formats, what I really loved was um, how, how they were able to kind of create stories. Um, and then I graduated uh, at the height of the recession. I wanted to get into journalism and the industry was like, LOL, there are no jobs. Um, so I had a pit stop at uh, an immigration law firm because I wanted to still kind of work in the Latino community. Um, and while I was working there, I was just trying to go out, network, meet people. And I, um, I stumbled into a party that was a quebajo party. I don't know if the New York folks are familiar with this party. It was uh, kind of started as an underground like Latino um, party. And it was music that I had never really heard before. It was this like sort of fusion of traditional sounds with more modern rhythms. And I was like, this is dope. What is this? And the DJs were like, oh, you know, if you want to find out about more events like this, you should check out a website called Remezcla, which covers a lot of this like scene. And so I went and looked up that website and found that it was covering young Latino culture um, in a way that I had never seen before when I was growing up. Um, I had always felt really proud of my identity and my culture, but I realized in that moment that even though I felt proud, I didn't think of us as being cool um, because I had never seen any popular media where we were presented as cool you know I associated us with like sort of corny variety show drama type things um so that I think was like a real light bulb moment for me of like oh I want you know other kids who grew up like me to see ourselves as being cool um and as being creating culture that is impactful and important um so that started a career in, in uh journalism and media uh I was at Remesca for seven years um and then this opportunity came along at Netflix. I think a lot of what I learned over my time, um, I relate a lot to, to what Jessica shared. A lot of what I learned over my time um, in media was, you know, we were fighting to shine a light on stories that weren't being told. But at the end of the day, we were a small, um, a small team. And uh, though I think we did punch above our weight in some ways, um, really, I realized that there's just a lot of power at large companies that are truly shaping uh, global culture. And if I really wanted to shift the way that the world sees our communities and the types of stories about our communities that I really needed to be in a space like that. So this opportunity came along and was really exciting for me, even though it was a pivot into marketing, which was the first. Um, and, and so I think ultimately what inspires me is, yeah, is just uh, creating culture that people in our community can see themselves in and can feel validated by and can feel empowered by. I love that. And I love how that story, your mission is directly aligned with your output. Queen of cool with Contodo for sure. <laughs> Appreciate that. Claribel, you want to tell us your story? Yeah. I mean, my story is, is a little bit different. Um, and, to, and I feel like I can relate to each of you. Um, I grew up watching Univision. Like it was the Mecca of everything for me and my household. Like that's all we watch. 
Um, and for me, I knew that I wanted to be in entertainment and in the advertising space very early on. Um, I have a family member who has pretty much built his entire career within the ad, um, ad world, and he was an amazing influence for me. But the road to get to where I am now is so different from other people and especially from my colleagues. Um, you know, I went straight out of college and I was like, I'm going to work for Apple. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be there full time. And the opportunity to be there full time was passed. I was passed over multiple times. And then I jumped into another job where for me, it wasn't the right fit. There was a lot of cultural differences. There was a lot of stress and strain put on me. And within four months, I was like, I don't want to, I, I can't, it can't just be all about the money. Like that was my kind of light bulb moment. And I was just like, I need to do what I love and what I'm passionate about. And I'm passionate about my culture, my heritage, where I come from. Um, and I want to work on bringing that passion to life through my ideas and through my stories. Um, so, you know, I sucked it up and I reached out to my cousin and I was like, hey, is there an opportunity to work at Univision? And he says, let me see what I can do. And he really was kind of the one who kicked off my career. Like he gave, he opened that door for me. And from there on, I always felt like my mission was to show um, a lot of our younger generations that are coming up that networking one is super important, but also that leverage who you know and tell your story, be a voice, work your way up. And for me, when I got to Univision, I knew I had something to prove and I felt like I had to prove it more than my colleagues because I didn't have the internship. I didn't come from multiple media agencies like they did. And I felt like the underdog. And I was like, you know what? I have a voice. I have a story to tell. I'm passionate about this company more than anything. So from there on, I'm, I was given a shot by this, my amazing mentor, Yvette Baez. And, you know, I was very persistent. I was like going to her with all like my papers, like, I want to be in this department. I want to work in marketing. This is where I need to be. And she saw that in me and she gave me my first shot. And from there on, I proved my, myself to myself my family and everyone else that you know you can work your way up and showcase your passion no matter what the obstacles are like you are your biggest uh, advocate and for me you know I knew that I wanted to bring storytelling and I wanted to represent our gente through my art through my ideas so for me it was it was a long journey a lot of tears but I will say that you know, I'm, I'm so grateful for every single one of those people who were on my path and opened that door for me. But also kudos to you for keep like for knocking for your persistence, um, for not stopping until you got the, the thing that you wanted. So just thank shows you. your, your integrity. All right, y'all, thank you for sharing. I think we're going to shift gears a little bit into, again, this topic of representation. Um, and I said it at the top, uh, you know, it's been a heightened conversation. And I know the Emmys can be triggering for us, um, brought up a lot of stuff on Twitter. I feel like I couldn't even scroll. I was like, I'm done. We're trending and I don't even, that can't be, <laughs> that can't be good news right now. Um, but it was an amazing year for a lot of creatives um, and content that deserved it for a long time. Um, and a beautiful year for black representation. Um, and I know again, the, the conversation, I don't want it to be a crabs in a barrel conversation because that's not where we're headed. But I do wonder in your position, where you were, what did this feel like for you? What did it call up for you? And this is open to all. So I would say who wants to jump in. I mean, I can jump in. I think, I think for me, it, it almost emboldened me to, to be able to walk into them and be like, guys, we have a solution. Like I have a platform where we can find these guys and shine the light on so that they can be spotlighted on and make it. So how do how do we fix this? How do we come back next year stronger and bigger than ever, right? So it almost gave me the, oh, but we can't have that happen again, guys. Like now there's like, salió el reportaje, right? And it's like, oh, but but this, this should be, this should give me la fuerza to walk into a room with my OP, with my acquisition, be like, let's find these guys. We have a platform. We have a space for them. Bullshit that we can't give them that shine in that space. So for me, it makes me like, I'm going to ask for it. What are they going to say? No. And I'm going to keep asking. Right? It almost made me bold to be like, no. In, in, the, in the day and age that we are, for that to be it, 
I call bullshit on it. And don't me diga me that we can't find that we don't have because we do. They're just not giving the spotlight and I have a solution. I have a place for them. So let's find them and give them the place. That's that's how I took it. Yeah. That's to all of that. So next, um, I think, oh. No, you go, you go, you go. Oh, I was just going to say, I think for me, it caused a lot of reflection on what are the obstacles for our communities um, to kind of come together and advocate for ourselves um, and really thinking about that. And, um, you know, one of the things that I see is I do think we have a really big challenge when it comes to even having the right language and terminology to talk about um what we need to talk about, right? Because we know, all, obviously all of the people uh, in this conversation know how diverse the Latino community is. It's really a collective of communities. And we just have sort of one term that we use that is supposed to encapsulate radically different experiences that are underneath that umbrella. And so I think that um, not having more specific terms, and I think we're starting to move in that direction, but not having more specific terms to name the different experiences when we talk about this is causing misunderstanding, is causing friction, um, is causing conflict. And I think that is one of the things that really stood out to me and inspired me to want to create more conversation within our community um, to arrive at better and healthier ways to have these dialogues and to shine a light on problems, right? I think ultimately um, the, the US tends to look at things in a very binary way when it comes to identity. And, um, and we know that there are segments within our own Latino community that are marginalized and are not re represented within the media that we are, ourselves are creating. So I think until we tackle those problems, um, we're never going to be able to create the type of unity and momentum that we need to advocate within a larger sort of power structure, right? Like, I think we need to interrogate that part first. So for me, it was just, um, you know, in some ways disheartening because I want to see us come together, but also necessary to address um, the fact that like our Black Latino community is not represented and we don't have the right language to talk about it. And when we say like, why aren't Latinos represented? You know, a lot of Black Latinos see themselves represented in the winds of um, our non-Latino Black community. So there's a lot of facets to it. And I think um, understanding those nuances, leaning into those conversations are steps that we can take uh, to really create a, a broader understanding. So for me, I think that's a lot of what I have been reflecting on observing these conversations. You, you hit the nail on the head too of like us not having the language and this copy and paste mentality that I feel like no one, it, none of us, all of us know it's like a totally different experiences and communities. And the, the one brand, the one name is, is hard for Latinos. And I think that's why we're now evolving and now like the adoption of Latinx and like, because, and also who's naming us? Like, it's just a lot. It's a, it's lot. a lot. And I'll say, you know, one thing which I, I saw, you know, before this panel started that you mentioned Nadia Hallgren, who is, um, you know, does have a historic nomination. She's the first uh, person ever to be nominated in both the directing and cinematography categories at the Emmys. And she is a Latina and she is an Afro Latina. Um, but I think because again, of a lot of the ignorance of intersecting identities that exist, um, that narrative isn't always elevated and crafted or even identified, right? So people outside our community may see the last name Hallgren, may see my last name, Gomp Brown, and never even know that, um, that she's Latina, um, or they may see a black woman and assume that she is not Latina. Uh, and so I think that that also harms us and why it's so important for people like us to be in these spaces is to be able to be like, hey, actually, we're missing an opportunity to create representation and a narrative because you just didn't even realize that it existed. Um, so I think that's the work that we have to do. And it's a lot of work, but that's what I kind of have reflected on. Yes, and big shout outs to Nadia. Um, she yeah doing her thing and, and that's she's film, amazing sure. yeah Amelia go ahead well Andrea already said a lot of the stuff I was gonna say so shout out to you for that and also shout out to Jessica because I think that we do have to be active and, and, and almost you know politely but forceful when we want to make these changes because if we're not doing it other people are not going to do it 
At the same time, I think that I, I do have like complicated feelings about this issue because while I, I, I want and I need to see more representation for Latinx people in general in television movies, I do feel like we need to be delicate when we approach the situation because I see a lot of people on social media at least um, kind of trying to take the, take the narrative and before we celebrate the wins of black people, immediately jump in and say, what about us? And I feel like we've done that time and time again. We've seen it happen, uh, you know, when Black Panther came out, you know, where's the, where's the Latino superhero? To which someone responded, didn't y'all have spy kids? Which I think is the best answer we could have gotten in that situation. But, um, you know, we need, to, we need to push a narrative forward that we are gonna have representation. We're gonna create this representation. We're gonna do the work to get there. But at the same time, we have to make sure that we aren't trying to shift the spotlight from black people onto us. And not to say the same thing Andrea said, that there are a lot of Afro Latinos that want this representation that have seen themselves in the Emmy noms and you know, the, the non-Latin black people that have got the wins. So I feel like we need to be considerate of others that might not share our exact experience. I think that especially goes for you know, white Latinx and mestizos that are, that have a platform and that have the narrative. Like, I believe I saw John Leguizamo tweeting uh, that he was angry and, and disgusted that, you know, there was no representation, but it's like, no, there's representation. It may, might just not look like you or, you know, fit your identity or idea of what Latino means, but it's very complicated because like you said, there's so many different identities. We are a collective of people and there's so many different communities within us. So we just have to kind of be compassionate with, with what our choice of words are and, you know, language is evolving and kind of just be compassionate to what other people's experience might be before we try to jump in to advocate for something that might not necessarily need advocating for. And Amelia, to, to, shy, to, to chime in, I think, um, I think Deb, it was, it, we had a conversation with Aida Rodriguez, who I love, and she comes with like knowledge. Like, she's not here all passionate, just hablando por hablar. Like she, she comes with knowledge. She, and she, was saying, she was saying that, you know, those kind of things make the black and brown people fight for the crumbs. We all here killing each other or like, do we do we do point the fingers because we're fighting for these little crumbs. There's a whole pie upstairs. Mm -hmm that no one's fighting for, right? So there's a whole pie, but here you have us bickering with each other who all have the same experience for the little crumbs, for like, we won't want roll. We won't want little thing. There's an entire pie up there and we can't even look focused because we're too busy right. fighting with each other. So yeah. I, when she said that, I was like, oh my God. It's like, it's como que, que lo hicieron a propósito. Like they have us so funnel vision que, que no, no miramos para arriba, like, yo, we can have a whole series. We can have, you know, we can have a Grey's Anatomy for 18 seasons, right? Like, we don't, we don't go up there and think. We stay here fighting with each other. So I felt like that was so, so great what she said, and it will stay with me forever, I think. Yeah, that's such an amazing statement because, um, like, all of you touched a little bit about, like, my sentiments. It's, and three words came to mind and it's education and support. And to what Jess is saying is that lack of support is what I sometimes feel like the industry wants. They want us to just stay within ourselves and not look up and see the bigger picture and see the, the big pie in the sky instead of us supporting each other and giving them their roses and their kudos. We're here just focused on the narrative and shifting and be like, what about us? No, no, no. Let's, 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 let's be like, Yes, you go, brothers and sisters. We're going to have our time and we're going to educate the industry on how we can create that time and how we can create that representation for us. So for me, it was just like, it, it, was, it was a struggle. It's, it's a struggle because you have to think about the language. You have to think about educating those around you. And you also have to think about how do I support and how do I le brindo ese apoyo a, a nuestros hermanos y hermanas and be like, yeah, you know what? Keep doing it. Keep representing. We're all, we're all one big family and we're going to make it to the top together. Right. Yeah. I think after, there's a lot obviously going on in, in the world and that's uh, afflicting our, our black and brown communities, um, specifically, you know, black lives. 
And I'm thinking like, if we're all going to change, it's going to require everyone to be uncomfortable. And just, we are a marginalized community and there's a lot of work to do too. But I wonder too, like if we do lean into education and, 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 you know, using words that we're not used to and, and, you know, checking our own people, like I feel like that's going to help us also just become a, a greater allies, greater allies and like help us too in, in the movement of, even if it's just our work is representation, but it requires um, that, that education as well. This is, I'm like, I got goosebumps and I'm like, wait, I'm supposed to be tracking the combo. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> um, so this is beautiful. I, um, I'm going to direct this question to you, Jess. You've been in the game for a minute, uh, running the first premium channel for Latinos with HBO Latino and whatnot, you know, get your flores. Um, what has been the biggest change you've noticed in the industry externally um, and internally? And, and, you know, whichever one you want to pick, I'm thinking here, like, let's be real. What has been the, the biggest shift? Yeah, so... Yes, I, I I feel like so una veterana in, in this of, of Latino and 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 programming and marketing. So, um, yes, I I I've been here and I've seen the progression of this channel and it excites me. And there is a lot of a lot of internal battles, obvio. And I'm, you know, I get my pop pals, but I'm like, oh, bueno, you know, I'm, I'm gonna still do it. Um, but I I think the some of the biggest changes I've seen is, you know, internally, we are officially a center of excellence. Our team is the, a Warner Media Center of Excellence. What that means is that we are tapped across the portfolio to make sure that we are out here looking, looking right and looking correct to specific audiences. So I, I lead any and all Latino Latinx initiatives across the portfolio. So it's stuff like, hey, Jess, you know, what do you think we should do when we promote this? Or is this tone right? Or like there's a comedy show and there was, so I, they're like, can you just watch this? And I watched it and I was like, mm -mm, can't have that we should not be talking about that we can't do that so before we were you, we were seen as almost like a threat because people didn't know who, who's this team like are they trying to take a piece of my lane and and like very protective very like no nope, we do this right and we've been in this game for about 14 15 almost 15 years now as as a team who is the best in the biz our our stuff is always popping we we create truly engaging experiences because it's not about just talking to a room it's touching that's how you engage this audience and we know that before it was like oh volume pay media they run the odds they'll, they'll come we're like that doesn't work for us like you need to like pay attention to us and not just on hispanic heritage month because we're latino the entire year not just in september right so i think that has changed where now uh, they come to me or like, just what do you think? And I was like, good of you to ask, girl, because you can't be going out there with this messaging or this tone or S Spaniard is not Latino. I have that conversation the entire time. I'm like, no, 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 we cannot. It's not. So that has changed internally. Externally, I think what has changed is um, I am now getting a lot of requests and ask for partnerships that before, like, not 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 interested in how do we collaborate with you? Now I got music producers, I got talent agents, I got comedians reaching out because they see what we're doing, and so that has become external, um, and so it's less of like, look, estamos en la compañía, and it matters, and now like people are noticing. So there's a lot more engagement from the the external folks that like oh yeah, we should pay attention. This is important. This is an audience. Without a Latino audience, no streaming platform can be successful. We have the numbers. That that in itself, that's my, I go to every meeting. I'm like, if you don't get us on board, guys, no one's watching. We have the numbers. You just get some of us on board and we bring our cousins, our friends, you know, we bring, we bring the people in. So I think that has been what I've seen in my over 11 years at HBO, um, and it excites me. Listen, I, I, was, I, I love my job. Personally, passionate about my love. I love my job. I'm giving wiggle room to go and, and Jessica, go figure it out. And I'm like, okay. So I, I do a lot of that. I'm creative and I'm passionate about it, but I see it. I see the progression. And even though sometimes you get the Emmy moment, like, I'm like, no, but 
it's okay, guys. We can fix this. Let's fix this. Está bien. Before, we were even in the conversation. That would have happened. No nominees. Ay, ¿qué importa? There's no conversation. No one's up in arms about it. Nada. Now, it's a conversation. So we can fix it. So that's my, I'm like, let's, let's do it. Let's fix it. How do we, how do we get it better? So, so, you know, that's, that's the shift that I've seen. And that's big. I think that I hadn't even noticed that. I feel like I mean, they seem flow with everything. I'm just like, hmm. like, I just gotta, you know, and I feel you're right. Like the fact that we're even having the conversations is, um, is really important and a sign that things are, are shifting. Uh, Andrea, this question's for you. Looking at your background from editor-in-chief for, La for a Latinx publication to head more head in charge uh, for Con Todo, what has been the biggest difference in championing with folks of the culture and then championing um, and, and, you know, kind of singing that song, doing that dance in spaces where now context and background is needed? Um, well, it is, yeah, it is extremely different, I will say. Um, you know, I think it's giving me a great... Uh, training in being able to explain the why and sell, right? Like you do have to do some selling um, and explaining. Uh, when, when I was working with an all Latino team, we were obviously internally all on the same page about why things mattered. Um, and really what we were doing was fighting to convince the external world um, to pay attention, uh, not to convince our own communities because, you know, we were all on the same page. And that's certainly, um, you know, different now that I'm at a global company, now that I am, you know, uh, in the minority. Uh, I wasn't in the minority in my previous uh, work experience. And I think, you know, even at, even in, even at Remesca, I think what, what has been also interesting and a shift is, even at Remesca, we were continually like learning and educating one another about our different experiences, because as we've talked about, because our communities are so diverse, right? Um, I think what I'm noticing can happen in, in a company, you know, in, in a larger company is people assume that one person can be the expert for a whole community. And it's like, that's not possible, right? I, I cannot speak for the entire Latino community. I have my lived experience. And thankfully, I also have professional experience where I was in an environment working with people of multiple different Latino backgrounds and covering stories of communities from multiple backgrounds. So, so that gave me that experience. But just having this identity doesn't give you um, that authority to speak for everyone. And so that's definitely something that I think has been an education moment is, you know, you, you'll probably need to talk to more than one person. You need, you need to get, um, run things by, you need to get uh, sort of visibility to more than one Latino person because um, we're a complex and diverse community. And um, yeah, you know, I think, I think a challenge that I have observed is that because, you know, as Jessica said, because we have the numbers and we are such a massive audience. We're a massive audience of entertainment fans. We're already tuning in. We, you know, when, when movie theaters were open, we were like killing it at the box office. We're streaming in unprecedented numbers. But I think it's also trying to help um, sort of the gatekeepers understand that just because the numbers are already high doesn't mean that you're succeeding, right? And also for them to understand like, Think of how much more you could be amplifying your message if you actually spoke directly to this community and tailored your conversation to them. We're an incredibly social community. We're more like two times as likely as other communities to share on social our opinions about brands, about experiences. Um, and so the fact that we're already doing it just because we have that natural propensity doesn't mean that you're safe and that we wouldn't necessarily bounce to the next thing. Um, and, and really getting people to kind of open their eyes and understand that actually you could be amplifying your share of voice a ton if you just spend a little more time and effort targeting your communication in a way that was like authentic and meaningful. Um, so that's, that's all been new for me and it's, it's been a learning experience, but I'm grateful for the, for the opportunity to be in the room and to get to say these things um, in spaces where they can really uh, make a change. Yeah. I often wonder, I'm like, oh, why are we so good? Like, why do we show up? <laughs> <laughs> we show up to everything. We buy everything. Oh, but it's also obviously the beauty of our community. Uh, Claribel, this one's for you. You're in a space that has been reigning supreme for U.S. Hispanic and Latinx communities for years. 
how do you insert your perspective and your, your point of view and find yourself heard in these spaces? I think for me, it's two key things. Um, one, it's not being intimidated by who's in the room. Just because there are higher ups in the room doesn't mean you can't say or voice your opinion, whether you agree or disagree more, and especially if you disagree, like say something. Don't let the people in the room and those who are sitting at the table make you feel inferior, like you can't say something. Um, because if you're going to be an advocate for our, for our people, you need to say something. You don't want to misrepresent nuestra gente or nuestra cultura. Um, so I think one is I completely do away, do away with the fear. And even though I, I'll do it respectfully, but I will challenge it. I won't be afraid to challenge and express my point of view to whoever is at the table. Um, I think another thing that has really helped me express my point of view and really be heard even more is I was fortunate enough to have two mentors, um, Yvette and Jomi, who encouraged me and really pushed me to use my voice and use a forum that our department has created. Um, and I've really been leveraging that a lot. And in this forum, it's, it's higher ups. It's, it's those top dogs at the boardroom. Like they'll see what I'm sharing, whether it's an inspiring article, whether it's things that brands are doing, whether it's things that in my opinion, brands aren't doing right or things that can inspire my team while they're working on a project or creating a story. So I really took this forum to heart um, and we call it sharing is caring. And I've leveraged this a lot and I've leveraged this especially um, when Black Lives Matter um, and George Floyd, everything happened. I, I was feeling some sort of way and I leveraged this forum and I sent a very lengthy email and I was like, apologies for the very long email, but this is how I'm feeling about this. And we're not talking about it. We're ignoring it and we're not talking about it. I want to talk about it. Let's express ourselves. And if you need to express ourselves, if you need to talk about it and express yourselves, let's create a moment. Let's, let's, but let's have the conversation. And for me, that was a very proud moment because I saw what that triggered. That triggered conversations internally and that triggered conversations within smaller teams. And for me, that's what this is about. I need to keep using my voice and I can't be afraid because of who's gonna see it. Because if, if I'm afraid of who's gonna see it, that's the person that needs to see it the most and I feel like. So powerful and a reminder that like there's also like some professional development that we need to be able to have crucial conversations to feel empowered because I've you know I came to realize too how much my Latinidad plays against me in some of these spaces where like yeah the, the culture right the fact that we're like you know el que dirán and we want to be appeased and like we don't like to ruffle feathers we respect our elders like all of these things that I'm like cool in my family but in the in the in the boardroom it doesn't work respect always pero how do you translate that and how do you make it work for you? So I think I'm all, as I hear you, Clyde, you're so strong. Um, and, I, and I'm sure that's been, um, you know, why you've been able to achieve the things that you have. Thank you. Thank you. And again, don't be afraid to ruffle the feathers because it only good things can happen when you ruffle feathers. Amelia, this is for you. You were able to be a part of the launch of Thesis and Marrow in Showtime, which we know played a crucial role in diversifying late night, what late night TV looks like. Can you tell us about that experience kind of shifting from different um, channels um, and what that's been like, uh, how you've been able to highlight what makes the show special on social media through your work? Yeah, for sure. Um, so when I was over at Viceland, I had been there for about two years and just being there, the Vice office is not a, a huge office and DeSamero used to film on the third floor. So I was doing uh, the social producer position for just the channel itself and my good friend Rob was on the channel with me but also working on Di Samero. So I would help him. I wasn't the point person for Di Samero, but I would go up and like take a picture or an Instagram story if a guest was there. And if he was out, I would help him cover copy. Um and then you know eventually he left and it was just kind of me doing all the copy and, and the social editor work for Viceland. Di Samero left. I know that's no secret. Um, so it was a little bit of a turbulent time at Vice. And I, I kind of felt like you, you can always tell when you're getting ready to, to move on to the next thing. And I had hit Marrow up just because, you know, they're, they're super cool guys. They're not uptight. You can just talk to them person to person um, and they'll hear you out. So I had hit him up and I was like, look, 
when the Showtime thing kicks off, you're going to take me with you? Can I, can I come? What's happening with that? You hiring? And he was just like, matter of fact, we're trying to get the whole team back together. I'm trying to get Rob. I'm trying to get so-and-so and this guy, Fulano and Fulana, and everybody to come from Vice over to Showtime um, because we love our team. So I had, an, I had an interview, and, you know, within a couple of months, um, I'm at the Zamero at the launch, and I, I think that I was so glad that I, I just, you know, took the jump to just message him and be like, hey, bro, can you help me, please, <laughs> because I'm trying to do something else. Um, and I did see it as a great opportunity. Um, and, I'm, and I'm super happy there because it's just, it's a really great workplace. Like I work, I did a year of freelance at Showtime um, as a social media manager. It's still doing what I'm doing right now, but you know, just the, the behind the scenes mechanics of the logistics kind of changed uh, because social media is a marketing position. So I had to kind of start out under Showtime. Um, before I could be hired as the production employee. So I think after my year freelance ran out, they just switched me over to the production side. So I'm technically uh, a De Samero employee, but I do still work for Showtime because the show is on Showtime. So like I'll be in both offices. When, when we were in offices, when offices were a thing, I would spend like four days a week at the De Samero office. And then one day we get Showtime or whenever I was needed to be in meetings. So it's a lot of communicating. Um, but for the social media aspect of the job, and I think especially reflecting on representation, I think having an audience who is centered in you know, the tri-state area, who is largely Latino, they understand a lot of the references that you wanna make. If you wanna make a certain joke, Mero references stuff all the time, I feel like if I just want to tweet something that I think will sound funnier in Spanish, I will. And I can trust that there are people that will get it. So I feel like kind of sliding my own agenda into, you know, a job that is otherwise professional um, has proved to be successful for me at least. Um, and even behind the scenes doing digital production, um, for example, my team, I'm, I'm one, of, uh, one of five on a digital team at Jesus and Merrill. And they kind of just were spitballing ideas for the holidays they didn't have anything for New Year's. And I was like, how quick can wardrobe get like a big Liberace robe? <laughs> and we ended up doing like, in the span of 24 hours, Mero did um, uh, like a Walter Mercado sketch, sketch. So he was kind of dressed in the long, gaudy golden robes. And we had him doing horoscopes. Like, we were obviously respectful, but you know how, if you have any uh, knowledge of how these Mero are, it's just spitballing and a lot of it was inaccurate and just very made up but very funny um he went around the office lighting palo santo and blessing uh, all the employees from the new year and it ended up being one of the most viewed videos that we ever published on social so i think it just goes to show when you have somebody that kind of gets it not to give myself too many flores behind the scenes but when you have somebody there that that understands these references and, and even the little things like the little jokes or, you know, the, the, the cultural icons, I feel that it, it, proves, it proves to help. There's nothing that it can do but benefit. So um, that's been my experience, at least. And I'm really grateful to still be there. It's like having, uh, like, two very famous coworkers. So they're just, they're around in the office. They kick it with everybody yeah. on the street. Like, you know, they are just super down-to-earth people. And um, they're really loyal to to the people that make things work for them. So I really appreciate them as bosses as well. Yeah, and I think it goes to show like, sometimes I feel like, especially in, 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 at work, I hear like, too specific, not enough audience, not a large audience. You like, you don't, you know, you gotta make a broad, broad appeal. And I feel like, well, no, then that's not our audience. Like we have to sometimes get specific. And within our audience, like there's still so many levels and layers and the success seems to be attributed to being authentic and being okay with being specific and speaking to a specific audience who like you're gonna trust that they get it they get it for those who don't then it wasn't for you right it's like that's the beautiful too, I feel like with these Samaro, i think like you know it's not a, i wouldn't call it an issue but it's just like a unique characteristic of these Samaro and their fan base i feel like it is like a very insidery fan base um because you know they have the podcast they had the vice man show they have a showtime show so i feel like there's already like this set list of jokes and references that they go back to and callbacks and this, this and that that kind of feel like inside jokes between like thousands of friends, but it's, 
you have to kind of approach it not from being too insidery at the same time. Yes, it, for the Spanish stuff, I think that it could be, maybe it wasn't for you. There's a group of people this joke was for, but at the same time, I think it, it's trying to create the appeal for the people that don't necessarily get it, where, you know, there might be an inside joke that people are, are laughing about on Twitter. And if you don't watch a show, you see it, you're like, hmm, what are they laughing about? I want to see what this is about. Maybe I'll watch the show. So I think it's like putting yourself in that unique space to kind of create that interest and the intrigue among people that, that don't necessarily uh, know a lot about who the guys are. Right, and that takes time. So people yeah, trying to see like quick results is like, well. No, yeah, and, and, I, and it, doesn't, it doesn't always hit, but you got to try different yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. I know we are way past the time, but I would like to do one more question for all of us to dive in. Is that fine? Dale. Okay. So, and you know, I kind of, this is a standoff and again, virtual, it's not like we can't all do it, but I would love to kind of take something that I've seen and see with your brains how it could have potentially been better. Like we recently, we recently saw with the beauty and the baker, just as I think like our community was like getting really into it um, and approaching it and, and familiarizing themselves with it it got dropped from ABC, from the network. Um, and I think, you know, I hear my, my big boss all the time tell me like, you know, we always get uh, chances while other communities get, or not other, just like the white privileged community gets opportunities. And so how, to me, it seems like Beauty and the Baker got a chance. And like, I don't know for how long, and I don't know what the threshold of that KPI or whatever was supposed to be, but I wonder, and if y'all want to chime in on like, why do we know do we think we know why it didn't work do we do we have an assumption do we have i don't think the time slot was helping so i would start there i mean i think um setting to set something up for success right like you can't put it in the corner without you know the resources to support it um so you know not to say that maybe maybe some success stories who are the exceptions can be born out of that, you know, kind of come out of nowhere. But I think a lot of the success stories you see is because internally a team created a support system that was going to set it up for that. Um, so, you know, I think knowing that like young Latino audiences are over indexing on um, streaming, et cetera, like were you creating the right type of content at the right time in the right space? you know, to tap into that audience. I think those are some questions that I, I would have started with. And then I, I also would just say that, I, I think this is a common talking point too, but um, we're always gonna have failures. And I think the failure, quote unquote failures in terms of like cancellations or things that don't work out. And I think it feels outsized in our community because there are so few things that actually make it um, to air or to stream. Um, and so really what I would love to see is like, there should be like a thousand shows like this. And then, you know, if some of them don't work out, it doesn't feel like our entire community has been set back. Right. Like, it's not like, um, I guess really for me, the bigger question is like, why is there just the one, you know, and, and then we use that as evidence that there is an interest. Like, it's not like anybody was like, oh, I guess we've hit our quota of like crime procedurals and, you know, we have the one. We have that, you know, law and order. So we're not going to make any more crime procedural shows. No, there's 4 billion of those shows. Um, and so I think that is also just something that I think about uh, in terms of normalizing, like not everything's going to hit. Right. Um, and even sometimes if you do give it all the best resources or robust marketing, it may not, you know, um, I think I don't have any insider information on this, but I do from, as an outside observer, I, I feel like, for example, stars really supported Vida um, in terms of like a robust campaign to support that show, um, you know, and it still didn't go beyond a third season. I love that show. Uh, so sometimes that's not possible, but um, even with all the best support, but I think our chances will be so much better if there's just more opportunities and more horses in the race, right? Um, so I don't know, that's kind of my ramble two cents on that. <laughs> no, uh, agreed. Anyone have thoughts, anyone else? I think me for that. me, it's, it's, it always, it's, it's so discouraging when that happens. And like, even though in my space, I'm, it's all Latino and it's all like Spanish, but for me, one of the things that I do when I'm advocating for my programming with my with my partners is I 
to a point that Jessica said is it's showing them the numbers. It's like, you need to invest in this because the audience is there and they want it and they're calling for it. And it's showing our best in class work and showing how nuestra comunidad, you know, it's a powerful comunidad and you need to tap into it and you need to showcase it because that's, that's how you're going to win with us. And when we see things like that happen, we just, we, we look at the brand and we look at them and we're like, really, that's, that's, that's how you're going to do us? You're just going to leave us like that? Like, okay, perfect. So I'm going to show you why you need to be here, why you need to be in this space and why you need to invest in us. Yeah. But I think to, uh, to Andrea's point, is it's like, you know, we got the one show, <laughs> right? And it's, 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 it's more of like, no, but give us a, you know, allow us, <laughs> give us more opportunity so that it doesn't feel so distraught when, you know, it, it, it doesn't become a success. Right. But also, um, yes, the Latinos are watching because, you know, it's cheaper to sit at home and watch a movie than go to like the South Hamptons. Right. Like we don't do that. It's, it's cheaper to just consume and eat a movie, even though the movie tickets right now are ridiculous. And, you know, it's like $200 to take a family of four. Right. But still it's cheaper than going on a vacation. Like I didn't go on a vacation when I was young, you know, like it was Santo Domingo and back. Right. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, you, you, you have to continue making these to continue to keep them engaged. And even though they're coming, they might not come the next, they're not guaranteed. They might not come the next time. It might, it takes one tweet. Let's say JLo is like, Senore, we're going to boycott this. It takes one tweet for me to be like, I'm standing with JLo. Nadie. I don't buy Goya. That's it. In mi casa no hay Goya. Right? Like it takes one like rallying to be like, you know what, we're not going to go watch that movie, pa ver que hacen, right? Like, so that's, it's almost like, ooh, ooh, we don't want to, we don't want to get them upset, but also give us more opportunity, give us more room to, 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 to play in. And we have, we're having a conversation with Cristela Alonso, and she was very really like, you know how hard it is to get a show greenlit? Just any show. So now you want to add the Latino on top of it. It's like, now we're going to get a one person opportunity. Like it's really, 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 really hard to get a show on a network. So kudos to even getting on it, but give us more opportunities, right? It's, it's like, we got one show. Yeah. That's my, that's my point of view. More opportunities, more pipelines um, for, for that and more work for us. <laughs> I got bills to pay. Right. <laughs> I want to be an, an essential employee. Right. I'm essential. You right. need a point of view so we don't look crazy out there. And like I keep telling, you know, I work from, obviously I work from home. And everyone's like, oh, oh, you work from home. I'm like, I'm an essential entertainment employee. <laughs> <laughs> These times. Entertainment might be essential, y'all. I don't know. It's, it's, it's what's keeping everything together and 100% insane like you need that feel good tone that feel goodness during these really really crazy times yeah. you really do and I hope <laughs> and I think with that like I hope that you all feel like listening to yourselves how amazing how important your work is you are essential um and and I'm uplifted and otra vez inflada <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word but like you know I feel very um although yes things are very bit hazy but my mission is representation and when i see everyone in your respective corners of the world working um you know working to make sure that that happens uh or spaces you know i am very proud um and i'm very happy and i'm you know wherever i can we can support um you i we would love to keep doing what you're doing thank you so much for the work for this time for these words and i hope whoever then watches this <laughs> uh, also enjoys it thank you for the invite and thank you for doing what you're doing because verdad, it's super inspirational and always happy to support with whatever you need de verdad. thank you thank god's you work there. god's work <laughs> y'all are building community it, it is it's really it's awesome thank you thank you so much bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. 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 bye.